Hello and welcome to another episode of the Classical Republican. Today we are meeting with Bailey Flanagan and Paul Gult. Now they were involved in the Washington Climate Assembly and they were a part of the sortition group. So uh, they had to come up with the, um, or the, the, yeah, they had to uh, help apply the algorithm that went into selecting the people who would be a part of that citizens assembly. So uh, let's begin and uh, please, please tell us about your backgrounds. Bailey, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University in computer science. Um, I'm advised by Ariel Prakasha um, and I worked with Paul and Ariel and uh, Anupam Gupta and on some work, Brett Hennig from the Sortition Foundation on um, basically designing algorithms for selecting the participants of citizens assemblies. Um, that's like one line of our work. And so this is basically how we got involved um, working with some Sortition practitioners previous to the uh, Washington assembly. Um, and then I believe they reached out to us, although I think Paul maybe knows more details about that correspondence, about how we specifically got involved in that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul, would you like to go ahead? Yes, sure. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher right now at Harvard University, um, and I used to be a, post, a, a PhD student also at Carnegie Mellon University. That's uh, where the collaboration started. And maybe just to elaborate a tiny bit on what Bailey already said, um, is that our work originally started from a collaboration with the Sortition Foundation, which is another nonprofit that organizes citizens' assemblies. Um, they're mostly based in the, in the United Kingdom, and this is where they organize most of their assemblies. And at the time, we were discussing uh, with folks over there what they needed out of a selection algorithm. And so we developed a selection algorithm that ultimately was used at the Washington Climate Assembly. Uh, has your work been applied to other climate or um, or uh, citizen assemblies? Wh yes. Which ones? So it was, yeah, um, it was used to select, uh, I guess, maybe the closest to home, um, an assembly in Michigan on COVID in 2021. Uh, but I believe that it's been also just applied um, by other organizations around the world through the Sortition Foundation's open source selection tool. Um, which several organizations use to select assembly. So we don't actually correspond with everyone who applies our algorithm um, because it's open source online and available for anyone to use. And, and for example, um, there was a big climate assembly in Scotland that was used using our algorithm. Or for example, in, in Belgium, there's a small region called Ospelian. And um, they have, are very special because they have the first permanent citizens assembly in the world. And to our knowledge, the, the newest version of the assembly is also selected using our algorithm. So we think that at this point, it's actually quite widely used. Wow. Wow. Uh, what year was the one in Scotland? Do you know? Probably 2020. 2020. Okay. Um, yeah, I know the uh, the UK is ha they have uh, um, a citizens assembly going also. Um, all right, very interesting. Um, so there are there are other um, uh, algorithms, aren't there? Uh, how many? How many do you do you know of that are used for sortition? I don't want to commit to a number, but um, I think we over time have encountered about five, six others, and many of them are variants of each other. So it's a bit difficult to count. All right, thank you. Um, I have this. Um, oh, I have the algorithm. Let me. Um, let's see. Multiple participants. Here we go. Um, let's go to the nature.com and let me see if I can keep you guys up at the same. Oh, wait, let me see if we go. Let me move this over. Oops. Okay. Okay. Here we go. All right. So right here, can, can you all see the, uh, the article uh, with the, um, with the uh, algorithm there. Uh, would you want, would you care to uh, break that down for us? Right now, I don't see anything. See it or no? Oh, you don't see anything? Uh, let's mm -mm. see. I got the share on, let's see, one person, let's see. Try this. And maybe if you don't, if you don't mind, maybe it would also be easier to just first talk a bit about the, the principles underlying the algorithm before we get sure. into the weeds about the, of the how. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, do you want to start with that or I am happy to? 
either way. Um, both is good. Um, John, do you want to ask a question about it, or do you want to oh. ask it, just go go ahead with um, it? Yeah, if you uh, yeah, what, what um, so we we have uh, jury selection in the United States, and that's um, you know, that's uh, random selection. Um, but uh, we don't we don't really um, factor in a lot of demographics into the well, some places they do, but but I from my experience, most places they don't. And so um, I just want to know about the uh, the um, uh, you know decisions that go into um, selecting the different demographics, um, you know, selecting the the different features that uh, will go in will be plugged into the algorithm. Sure. So just to give a little bit of background on like how this differs from jury selection, which I think is kind of important, um, is that in jury selection you have a little bit more power as the people organizing the jury. Um, to compel people to participate. Whereas in citizens assemblies, you really can't. And so one of the problems that arises and actually like the problem that we're addressing with our algorithm is that when you ask people to participate in a citizens assembly, the pool of volunteers who says yes is very, very demographically skewed. Um, it's like often not at all representative of the underlying population whose interests you're hoping to represent on the panel. And so the reason that the problem is hard is basically what we need to do is we need to take this pool of volunteers, people who have said, yes, I would participate in a citizen's assembly, and we need to select a panel from them um, that is demographically representative. And so this is really the algorithmic problem and why it's different in jury selection, um, because I think you will naturally get a slightly more demographically balanced pool of jurors just by virtue of the fact that you kind of have to participate. So um, basically the criteria that our algorithm aims to optimize um, or like do as well as possible on are twofold. The first is that the panel should be demographically representative um, up to quotas that are on features, which you mentioned. Features, uh, when we talk about them, we mean um, different gender categories, different age categories, different geography categories, um, often actual opinion on some aspect of the issue at hand. Um, and the way these features are chosen actually is not part of our work. Um, this is something that the people who are organizing the assembly, who know the underlying population demographics well and have sort of crafted the task of the panel, they're the ones who choose these features. What our algorithm does is it just accepts a set of quotas um, and then subject to these demographic quotas that you wanna satisfy, it tries to give every volunteer as fair of a chance as possible of being chosen um, for the panel because this is like a random process. And so what the fairest possible means, that's like, I think this gets at what you were saying before about an ethical judgment. And we can talk about that more, but this is basically like the two criteria of the algorithm, these demographic quotas, and then also making sure that people are getting a, as fair as possible of a chance of being chosen. Um, Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I think you said it very well, but maybe, um... I could just also outline, like, repeat some of that by saying how it differs maybe from what you would want in a jury selection process. So uh, a very big difference in a jury selection process is also that there's no ex very explicit goal for what this group of jurors really should look like. Um, once you randomly select people and they show up, you have this adversarial process where the the prosecution and the defense, defen um, um, the defense, they can strike um, di different juries from the jury. So there's no idea even of this process being something that has to be open to everybody. I could have characteristics that make me an attractive jury to strike, and it would be perfectly fine for me to be always struck from the jury. And in citizens assemblies, there is um, more of an idea that everybody in the citizenry should be able to participate in that, subject to having the chance of being selected. And so. Um, yes, on the one hand, we do want representativeness, and representativeness is something that a jury doesn't have to satisfy, but that is very important in our experience to the people organizing a citizens' assembly. But then there's also an idea of, of fairness and equitable access to um, perhaps an equality of opportunity for people to, to participate in the assembly and have their voice heard. And so this is, I think, why these, these two objectives of representativeness and equality, or barely called it fairness, uh, why they're very specific to citizens' assemblies and not quite the same as in jury selection. Thank you. Um, do, do either of you have uh, 
have, have you come have you uh did, you didn't study any historical um uh uh examples of of sortition like in uh you know uh in, in renaissance florence or um venice or in ancient athens were those uh in the back of the mind anywhere when you were designing this or or not um n n not really i i have read some of these as, a, as an amateur and um to a point where i'm not quite uh quite confident making a lot of connections and, and detailed analyses i i think that we're starting from a very different position because um our, our approach is very mathematical and so it's very based very much based on on modern mathematics, modern ideas of statistics that were only developed very recently. And if we're talking about these timescales in which statistician has been used. And so we're really talking about probabilities. We're talking about the fact that a random sample of, of the, from the population will probably have good properties. All of the things that we're familiar with in polls and those were not known at all uh, in antiquity, were not known in the Renaissance. So I, I think we're coming at it from a much more mathematical and much more modern standpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, so can you see the uh, the article now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> so uh, why why don't we get started on on how it works? Okay. Um, do you want? Are you gonna? Are you showing? Gonna show the figure of the algorithm? Maybe that would be like the most helpful visual aid from the paper. Yeah, where is that? If, I, if you click algorithmic framework, I believe that's the the figure of interest. Uh, on the upper right. The, yeah. yeah. Oh, right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. There you yeah. go. Yeah, mm -hmm. right there. Oh. Okay. If you scroll down, there should be a figure. This there one. We go. All right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you Maybe... could click on full size image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. faster than us. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm trying to gauge the level of detail here. Paul, do you have a sense of this right now? Um, I I think that we're probably not quite there yet. Like uh, where we should talk about the details, and and I don't know if if the details at this point are the most interesting to to a general audience. I think we should maybe speak about what the inputs are to the algorithm. And then mm. what it what it really aims to achieve. If this figure mostly shows the the how how the sausage is made, like how we mm -hmm. get to the point of fairness that we want to do. But um, maybe we can first talk about what fairness means in general. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, a selection algorithm in the way that we think of it, and this perspective has very much been inspired by the selection algorithms that were used before our work. So algorithms that we really use in practice. Um, what it takes in is, first of all, a list of all the people in the pool. So all of the people who have volunteered to serve on the panel and their respective demographic and, and other group membership. And then we also take in the definition of these groups. So uh, as Bailey said before, um, many different uh, groups, for example, um, a group could be all women or all people from a specific state or a specific region. And for each of these groups, the practitioners in current practice set uh, a lower and upper number of how many uh, members of the panel are allowed to come from this group. And so this is the input. And the algorithm somehow has to do a lot of computation and then randomly choose which subset, which, which people from the pool should be selected to be on the panel. And the question is how how do you best do that? How do you best make the selection? And how do you make it the most random if you want? Bailey, do you want to talk about what we mean by most random? Sure. Um, yeah, so like the ideal case here, like the dream would be that we could just sort of uniformly sample people in the population. Like just zooming out from our algorithm for a moment, it would be really nice if we could actually just use a, like a, a, a standard lottery, like a uniform lottery. Um, and so this is really like the target goal of what we mean by most random is that everyone in, in the set of volunteers has the same probability um, of being chosen for the panel. The problem is that this is actually not generally possible to do. Um, and that's because the pool of volunteers is so demographically skewed in some respects, like because we have way fewer members of certain groups than we should compared to what we want on the panel, there's fewer available seats um, or there's actually more, sorry, available seats for those these underrepresented groups. And so they have to be chosen with like 
higher probability than equal. And so we can't perfectly equalize. And so then the question is, how do you measure like how far from equal you are? And this is a subjective question. Um, and there's many different notions of what we call like notions of fairness um, that measure this, that basically take in a list of like for every single person, their probability of being chosen. And it basically takes that list of, of numbers of probabilities and it measures how fair it is. So if those numbers are all the same, it's as fair as possible, um, but it can't always be. And so then there's all kinds of different measurements that you can use. So they're called fairness notions. And we, we draw these fairness notions from the field of fair division, which is like a field of computer science. And many of them are based on um, political scientific notions. Like there's one based on Rawlsian fairness that we use. Um, I'll give you an example though, of the one that we use, which is basically that the person with the least probability of being chosen should have as much as possible. So you can think about this as like putting a floor um, on the probability of being chosen that anyone gets and kind of pushing it up as far as you can um, and making sure that everyone's chance stays above that. And you're gonna you're gonna get stuck at some point, but you wanna make, basically make sure the worst off person is as well off as possible. And this is essentially the notion of fairness that our algorithm uses. Although as you'll see in this paper, um, our algorithm can actually be used with any notion of fairness that satisfies some simple mathematical properties. Um, and, and this is really important to us, I think, because we don't feel like we're the people as mathematicians who should be making this decision. We really hope that practitioners and others in this space will have a conversation um, about what really, what does it mean um, to be fair in this respect um, in citizens assemblies? So I don't know if that, I, Paul, do you want to add anything to that? But not immediately. John, are there things that, that would be useful for you to hear more details about to maybe um That's very fascinating. Re explain? Um so so in so the people who came up with the fairness criteria in the uh Washington Climate Assembly, was that the um the legislature that uh that I know they had uh several members involved in creating it. Um were they the ones who came up with the, the fairness criteria? No, um in so, so in, in this case, to, to my knowledge, the um, I, I do not exactly know how the um, um, I, I, I I will believe you if you if you tell me that the legislature was the one to, who uh, who commissioned the citizens assembly. I'm actually not familiar with that part. Um, but they put the selection of the assembly in the hand of a company called Cascadia Consulting, and I believe that they are a nonprofit consulting company that then had members. <laughs> Uh, in, in the organizing committee, like Martin Gerwin, who, who you will speak with um, uh, soon, I think. And um, Martin, for example, has extensive uh, experience in, in selecting citizens' assemblies. He has organized many citizens' assemblies in Poland, for example. And he decided that for, for the citizens' assembly that was being organized, our algorithm was a good choice with the fairness measure that uh, we have been recommending, which is the one that Bailey already alluded to which pushes this minimum chance and makes sure that every per that no person has too low of a chance of being selected. Nobody in the pool will be left very sad because the dice are entirely stacked against them. Okay. All right, so, so if there are any complaints about fairness, it's not really the algorithm's fault. It's not your fault. It's uh, the people who uh, gave you those inputs. Is that correct? I, I, I think in a sense, yes. Um, I, I think our algorithm will always do the best that is mathematically possible, subject to the constraints of the situation that is put in. And the situation, of course, doesn't have to be the fault of the people using it. It could be that, for example, there was unexpectedly low sign-up rates among some part of the, the population, and, and you will find yourself in a, in a tricky situation. If, for example, you want to represent, um, say, people who do not believe in climate change on a climate assembly, it could be that very few of these people sign up. And of course, organizers try to preempt this and to send out a lot of invitations to often enough get lucky, but sometimes they don't get lucky. And so that, for example, might be a situation where there's simply no good choice anymore. But the, the algorithm can promise to always take the best choice among the choices possible according to a specific definition of what is best. All right, very good. Okay, so what's the next step?
in do you mean uh what in, exactly in what realm are you referring to oh so you've got the inputs uh so so how does it work next oh yeah. gotcha okay um okay so without going into too much of how the sausage is made basically the idea of the algorithm is that you are hoping to find one group of people of a fixed size like let's say k people you want to find k people that satisfy your criteria and you also want to make sure that you're giving them really fair probability and so what our algorithm does to make sure that we can both be random in this process and also always make sure that we satisfy these quotas is we find a lot of possible groups of k people that satisfy these quotas so in that in this picture that you're looking at in case you want to follow along in the picture these little blue squares are um all the different panels possible panels that we're finding and we compute them um and we make this big list of these panels and then what we do is we we basically try to we're going to draw the panel we're going to draw our our winning panel randomly um and we're going to specifically do it in a way that assigns probability to the different panels in a way that is as fair as possible to the people within them so you can imagine that if i'm a person i'm me and i'm only on one panel but paul is on panels give all the panels the same probability then i'm going to be chosen way less often than paul right because if you draw yeah. a panel where they're all the same probability, it's going to be really unlikely that you pick a panel with me on it, but it's going to be very likely that you pick a panel with Paul on it. And so the idea is that we tune these probabilities in a way that makes them fairer to all the individual people who are on the panel. So in this example, you would want to give the panel that I'm on higher probability than, than the panels that Paul is on, because then our probability of being chosen will add up to the same amount. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is basically how we do it. And then at the end, we have this distribution, it's called this set of probabilities for each panel that we found. And we draw one panel out of our hat based on these probabilities. Um, and this is the final panel that's chosen. And so this panel is guaranteed to satisfy the quotas because every panel we considered satisfied the quotas. And we've also tuned the probabilities so that this draw is fair to people at the same time. Okay. All right. So, so these blue squares represent a a a group of people is that what is that the what blue saying? squares right exactly they represent a group of k people it's a possible okay. panel that we could choose okay yeah yes. and 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 if you don't mind let, let me just drive this point home again i'm, I'm not saying much much new things okay. but i think this is really you, a really big point of differentiation to to earlier algorithms which you mentioned earlier so um all the other algorithms that we're aware of they uh, use a random process to find a single panel. And um, that, that's a decent approach and, and that will give you a panel, but it makes it very difficult to argue about the fairness. So for example, we, we draw a random panel and Bailey is on it, but I'm not on it. It's very difficult to then say, well, what other choices could this random algorithm, where could it have gone a different direction and I would have been chosen? Have I been unlucky or have I been treated unfairly? And so that's that that's the, what most other algorithms or all other algorithms do. And by contrast, um, our algorithm builds this list of panels, or um, as as Bailey said, this distribution over panels. And the way that I think about it is, it essentially builds a wheel of fortune, um, where um, where there are many different slices, and on every slice there's a panel. So on every slice belongs to a different set of maybe thirty, maybe one hundred people, and so. Over the time, it builds ever more complicated wheels of fortune with ever smaller and ever more adjusted slices, ever more, more different slices, until eventually it finds this really nice wheel of fortune that we can give one spin and where every person um, looking at how many of the slices I'm, for example, on, every person will say, well, there are enough slices that I'm personally appearing on, and this is the fairness. And so there's really something uh, rather complicated uh, going on and rather beautiful of, of balancing these slices in finding new slices to add until eventually adding new slices doesn't help anymore at all. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so then we come over here and we have the 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 final panel and that's the one that's yes. chosen. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Um, so when this is actually um, occurring, when you're running the algorithm, uh, is there any kind of oversight over you to make sure you're not just 
doing whatever you, you want to do. <laughs> so the transparency of this process is actually uh, something we've thought about, but it's also remains somewhat of an open an open problem. Basically, our algorithms are fully open source. Anyone can, in principle, check them to make sure that they're truly optimizing the way that we say they are. Um, you can also run them in an open source way. So if you wanted to, you could test them and see what they're doing. Um, you can observe the probabilities given to each person at every single run of the algorithm. And we actually have done some follow-up work that um, makes this even more simple and allows you to draw the panel through a, an actual uniform lottery, like with lottery balls while maintaining essentially all the fairness guarantees of this more complicated algorithm. So in that case, which I'll let Paul talk more about, I think there's even a figure down below that shows how it works. Um, in that process, people can observe the probability with which they're being chosen for the panel directly without really any knowledge of, of probability. The big challenge here is confirming that the probabilities that come out of our algorithm are truly as fair as possible because they're, they're different, right? Because there are constraints in the problem. Um, this, you would need some technical background to be able to confirm because you need to be able to either open up our algorithm or test it, test it out. Um, this is very hard um, because the algorithm is, is very technical. So this is still something that is um, very open, but um, you could in principle check. But maybe Paul, you can talk a little bit more about the uniform lottery approach, which is I think pretty cool. Yes, yes. And let, let, let me speak about that in a second, because this is also um, actually this has been used for the Washington Climate Assembly. So so it's very topical. But in, in my mind, I think transparency and verifiability um, really belongs to three different stages of this process. Where the first stage is at all gathering the inputs to the algorithm. So, for example, who ends up actually being in the pool, who receives a letter of invitation, is everybody who, who signs up um, actually being counted? Are all of their responses being found? That is very important. It's very important what the demographics are, something that you've already alluded to, how tight and uh, how, how the quotas are set for the different groups. So this is sort of on the input side. And this is something where transparency, I think, is very important, where transparency is also the most difficult. Um, we do see some some movements there. So we know that, for example, organizations like Healthy Democracy in Oregon, they have some best practices and they try to make as much of that uh, upfront public as possible. So, for example, they um, they have established procedures for setting these quotas and um, they communicate this very, very openly because they're aware of, of how crucial it is. But this is also, in a sense, something that we can't really contribute much to the fairness of because this happens before our algorithm ever gets started. Then the second stage that Bailey has alluded to is this optimization stage. So where this algorithm runs, where it builds this um, wheel of fortune of different panels. And in this stage, um, this is the, the stage that is most complicated to explain. So this is the stage that really is, requires graduate training in, in mathematics or computer science to really follow the steps through. We try really hard to, to make this as transparent as possible. As Bailey said, we have released this code as open source. So if there was something really sneaky in it, um, everybody in the world is, is open to, to catch us. I, I promise that there's nothing sneaky in it. Um, people can run this code on their own computers, so they don't have to trust our computer, and we can't change the numbers after the fact. And also the algorithm, so not really the code being written, but the, the procedure behind it, is written up in this paper, which was peer reviewed. So other scientists have taken a very close look at this and have come to the conclusion that what we do is legit. And then there's a final stage, and, and this is now uh, getting at what, what Bailey actually wanted me to speak on, which is <laughs> once, once you have the Wheel of Fortune, there's still, now comes the randomness, namely, which of these slices do you choose? Which, which one is the actual panel? And this is something that we can make transparent very easily, yeah. namely, we we could either have our computer spin the Wheel of Fortune for you and tell you this is the panel, but really our algorithm can just hand you the Wheel of Fortune and let you spin it yourself. And in a sense, this is what, uh, what happened in, in the Washington Climate Assembly, that we produced not exactly a Wheel of Fortune, but um, I believe that they threw dice. And we said for every single combination, so maybe it was four dice, I don't remember the, the exact numbers, but something like this. So you have six times six times six times six, many different outcomes of what the four dice will give you. For each of them, we said, if, 
if the dice end up one, two, three, four, then these 100 people will be chosen. If it ends up one, two, three, five, these people will be chosen. And so, so far, nothing has been random yet. Everybody can check and can see, well, Bailey personally appears on many of these different dice combinations. So she knows that if the dice are actually being rolled, then she has a decent chance of being selected. And then uh, what the organizers at Cascadia did was actually to just throw these dice in a live stream. And so people could see with their own eyes that it was really a randomness that the, the result was not fixed. And we think that this is a really important contribution to fairness. And to, sorry, not to fairness, to transparency. Okay, very good. Um, all right, let me, um, oops, oops, I lost there, hold on. Uh, thank you, 